Good afternoon. My name is Maisha Hutton, and I am the executive director of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, or the HCC. We're based in Barbados in the Caribbean. The HCC is a proud partner of the American Cancer Society in the global fight against cancer and other non-communicable diseases. It's my honor today to moderate the second panel of distinguished speakers who will compare and contrast what the cancer journey looks like for a patient and caregiver in the developing world and low and middle income countries. These thought leaders will present a very thought provoking perspective and share with you the important role that the society has in global cancer control. As you would imagine the statistics in the reality for the same cancers look very different in developing countries. Staggering health inequalities between rich and poor still remain, raising fundamental questions of social justice and who should have the opportunity to live a healthy life or not. Cancer and other chronic non-communicable diseases, or NCDs, are responsible for 60 deaths globally every year. A recent report released by the prestigious Council on Foreign Relations Independent Task Force on NCDs underscored the urgency of this health threat by referring to the NCD epidemic in low and middle income countries as an emerging global health crisis. This is the only time the Council has issued a report on a global health crisis. In 2011, the United Nations held a high-level meeting for world leaders to address the increasing burden of cancer and other NCDs, only the second time the UN has done so around a health issue, the first time being in 2001 around HIV and AIDS. The growing consensus among the international health community is that urgent action is needed if we are to prevent a global pandemic of chronic diseases such as cancer in low and middle income countries while at the same time, incidence and mortality from cancer in countries such as the US is decreasing, in large part due to the success that the ACS has achieved in the past 100 years. In the Caribbean, where I work, cancer and other chronic non-communicable diseases are the predominant health challenge, responsible for seven out of every 10 deaths. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the Caribbean, and we have some of the highest incident rates of cancers in the world, including those for prostate and cervical cancer. Low and middle income countries, such as those found in the Caribbean, are often decades behind developed countries when it comes to cancer care, as evidenced by significant disparities in cancer survival rates. Health systems are often ill-equipped to support comprehensive cancer control programs. The leadership in the Caribbean recognized the significant health and economic threat back in 2007, when they convened the first in the world summit of heads of government which crafted the Declaration of Port of Spain on non-communicable diseases. Heads of state, proud of their achievement, have continued their advocacy for the recognition of this regional and global disease burden due to NCDs. My organization, the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, was born out of the commitment of Caribbean leadership to galvanize a whole of society approach to NCDs and chronic diseases involving all sectors of society, including civil society, such as those represented here at this summit. Today we have two very distinguished panelists who will be sharing perspectives on global health and the disproportionate burden of cancer in low and middle income countries and how the American Cancer Society can have a measurable impact. Since most of us have flights to catch tomorrow, we are going to dispense with the very lengthy list of credentials that our expert panelists share these bios can be found on the apps by clicking on this session. There will be a brief question and answer at the end of the session. I now have the distinct honor of introducing internationally acclaimed scholar, professor at the prestigious Georgetown University School of Law, and author of many publications, including recently published and highly acclaimed book, Global Health Law, also found on your app, Professor Larry Gostin who will discuss the global health framework within the context of health as a social justice issue. Joining Professor Gostin is Ambassador Sally Cowell, Senior Vice President of Global Health for the American Cancer Society. Ambassador Cowell has a distinguished career in the U.S. Foreign Service as a diplomat having served multiple posts around the world, including Ambassador to the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. After her service as a career diplomat, Ambassador Cowell went on to become one of the founders of UNAIDS in Geneva, where she worked for more than a decade with Dr. Peter Piat, the co-discoverer of the Ebola virus. So welcome, Professor Gostin and, and Ambassador Cowell. We're going to start off with Professor Gostin's perspective. 
Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege and honor to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, the ACS, Bob Chapman, who uh, has been supporting me for uh, quite some time, and we've been discussing uh, global governance for health and NCDs and cancer. Um, I have three key messages that I want to try to convey to you. Uh, and there, if you can think of these three as your take home messages, I will be so delighted. The first one is, is that there are unimaginable injustices to the poor in the world, both within countries like the United States and among countries between rich countries and poor countries. And this amounts to huge global health inequities uh, in cancer prevention, control, and the burden of cancer disease. The second message I want to say is, is that globally, there is virtually no funding or political commitment to cancer and NCDs. And so while we've worked so hard as a cancer community here in the United States, for a political commitment to this problem and for funding, for research, prevention, and, and treatment, uh, none of that has been translated globally where the real burden of disease uh, lives. And the third and perhaps most important message that I want to convey is that we don't have to accept the status quo. There's something we can do about it, and there are proven solutions. Now, a lot of my talk is going to be based upon data, statistics, arguments to try to prove this all to you. And because that can be very boring, I want to begin with uh, what I call in my book on global health law, a global health narrative. Just a simple story. And this is a story of Sarah Stulak. Um, Sarah is a pediatrician in Rwanda. And one day, a young girl, a young uh, Rwandan girl, came to see her. And she had a tumor the size of a cauliflower on her face. Her father was a subsistence farmer. Uh, and for many years, uh, he had tried to get his daughter traditional medicine. Uh, they never saw a doctor until they came to Sally, who was a pediatrician. Sally immediately understood that she needed an oncologist and she needed it desperately for this little girl. But there was no oncologist in the entire country of Rwanda. But this one story had a happy ending. An American oncologist came, gave her state-of-the-art care, and she was a cancer survivor. But that doesn't happen for the vast, vast majority. And so what I want to talk about today is first the globalization of non-communicable diseases and cancer, funding and politics, and proven solutions. In other words, what we can all do about it. We tend to think in terms of globalization as fast-moving infectious diseases. Um, think about Ebola virus disease that has been capturing the headlines. Uh, we know that a person can get on a plane uh, in West Africa and fly to the United States in less than a day. The person might also have pandemic influenza. Bird flocks migrate. We understand intuitively that infectious diseases are global health emergencies. But we don't tend to think about cancer as a global health emergency. But in fact, it is. The risk factors for, uh, for NCDs and for, for cancer, we think of them as rich country diseases, just things that happen to the rich. Tobacco, if you think about it, used to be an accoutrement of a good life. Movie stars used to smoke tobacco. Alcohol and rich foods we associate um, with, with well-off people who can afford those kinds of things. And physical inactivity, we think of well-off professionals who live sedentary lives, not hard laborers. But the truth is anything but that. Cancer actually devastates the poor and the disadvantaged within countries and among countries. Fully 65% of all cancer deaths in the world 
are in low and middle income countries, and 80% of all non-communicable diseases are in low and middle income countries. This is more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. The conventional wisdom also is, is that cancer is a problem for the old or the elderly. But in fact, globally, cancer deaths occur in middle age, 50% of them before the age of 65. But think about Sally, Sally's case and this little girl that Sally saw. Why does cancer devastate the poor, more than the rich even? Well, first is prevention. Prevention risks migrate from the rich to the poor. Uh, and so if you think about this kind of globalization of diseases, I just got back from Bangladesh, I've been to Uganda, I've been to Beijing, I've been to New York, I've been to Delhi. If you go to any country in the world and go to a large urban area and make a 365 degree turn, you'll see the same thing. You'll see people smoking, much more so in low and middle income countries than here in the United States. You'll see alcohol, tobacco, you'll see McDonald's, Burger King, uh, other fast food establishments. You'll see alcohol advertisements and sales. And all of these things are happening to demonstrate that really we have a harmonization of cultures and so Globalization is not just a problem for infectious diseases. Globalization is something that very much fuels cancer deaths throughout the world. So prevention is a problem that moves from the rich to the poor. But the poor also don't have the advantages of vaccinations and other preventions of infectious diseases. We think of cancer as a non-communicable disease, but in fact, one out of every six cancers in the world is attributable to infectious diseases. But the poor, in poor countries in particular, have very little access to infectious disease control. And one critical example would be vaccination for human papillomavirus, which is responsible for most cervical cancer deaths. Uh, people in poor countries don't have access to this and so die at increasingly uh, uh, preventable ways from uh, cervical cancer. And then, as in Sally's case, you saw screening and diagnosis come very late. In poor countries, there's very little screening for cancer. When they do get diagnosed, it's either very, very late stage or they never get a diagnosis and then just die. And then treatment, treatment is almost, for cancer, almost non, non-existent and certainly unaffordable for the vast part of the world. For example, if you look at the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines around the world, virtually none of them are cancer medications. And think about how that's different than in the United States. And the last panel was so magnificent and is so inspiring. It was about palliative care. It was about pain relief. But the poor and in low and middle income countries almost never have access to pain relief. Virtually all of the pain relief medication is in the United States, in the European Union, and Australia. Virtually none of it, less than 1% of pain medication occurs in poor countries. And so, People die, they die young, they die suffering, they die in pain, their families suffer, and their communities suffer, and their countries suffer. But there's something we can do about it. Currently, there's only one international agreement that affects cancer, and that is the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And it has been remarkably successful. Since the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control have been involved and the American Cancer Society has been actively involved in this through the NCD Alliance and others, 80% of countries in the world have gotten greater, um, uh, have changed their laws for more tobacco control legislation. 
If you compare that to other risk factors for cancer and non-communicable diseases, it's pitiful. A recent survey of 188 countries, for example, found that none of those 188 countries had lowered their obesity and over overweight rates. Uh, little has been done. So apart from the Framework Convention on, global, on Tobacco Control, what do we have? Well, there's been a UN political de declaration on non-communicable diseases, but virtually no funding and very little action. There's a WHO action plan on non-communicable diseases, but it's voluntary. But imagine a world where we actually had international agreements devoted to cancer and to NCD risk factors, and that we put some priority and political muscle into it, which we don't. And the political muscle translates into funding. What we need more than anything else is sustainable funding globally for cancer prevention, control, and treatment. If you look at the World Health Organization's budget, it devotes 88%, only 8% to non-communicable diseases and only a smaller, much smaller portion to cancer. And that compares with an 80% burden of disease from non-communicable diseases. I've talked about WHO's essential medicines list, which doesn't even list most cancer medications. The United States is no better. Although funding in the United States domestically for cancer is still not nearly enough, Globally, it's virtually non-existent. Fully 80% of the United States global health budget is devoted to infectious diseases. 50% of its budget is AIDS alone. National um, non-communicable diseases are not even a line item in the global budget. And cancer is not even a line item in the global budget uh, that we have. And so, we really completely ignore cancer suffering and death. But consider cancer and other burdens of disease in Sub-Saharan Africa. 25% of the burden of disease exists in Sub-Saharan Africa, but Sub-Saharan Africa has 3% of the health workers, virtually no cancer treatment, no cancer oncologists, and less than 1% of the world's health spending. And yet the global cost of tobacco, NCDs, and cancer is projected to be nearly $50 trillion by 2030, and yet we devote virtually no funding to it. Right now, I'm actually about to go to Geneva, we have a global fund for AIDS, TB, and malaria. We have the Gavi Alliance for um, vaccination of children. These are terribly important things, but imagine if we had a global fund for cancer and that we devoted the same kind of political attention uh, to cancer prevention and treatment globally and to try to cut down these unimaginable health inequalities. So what are the proven solutions? In addition to funding, we need to do better regulation. Um, tobacco, for example. Uh, we've reduced prevalence of tobacco in the United States, but the tobacco industry is moving very, very aggressively in low- and middle-income countries um, to market their products. And what we regulate here at home is not regulated uh, elsewhere. Uh, if you look at um, food, uh, food uh, is marketed, sold, both in the United States and in low and income countries in ways that are promote cancer and other non-communicable diseases. Um, we, it, I, I believe very, very strongly in healthy eating, but it's hard to do. Saturated and trans fatty acids are in our foods. Sugar is put into everything ubiquitously. We have high sodium rates. We have ultra processed foods. Children are marketed with sugary cereals, sodas, and other snack foods. And it's impossible for parents to make wise decisions. <coughs> it's a shell game. If it's low fat, it's high in sugar, and et cetera, et cetera. 
in the built environment, if you, I just came back from Bangladesh, there are no walking paths, there are no bike lanes, there are no parks, there are no playgrounds, there's no mass transportation. People are completely sedentary and they're eating Western diets, becoming fatter, dying of cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. And we also need a multi-sectoral re response because the truth is that cancer and other non-communicable diseases are not only the responsibilities of departments of health, they're departments of agricultures, of trade, of urban planning, and many others. We need an all of government approach or what the WHO calls health in all policies where all governments pay attention to NCDs and cancer. We need an all, so all of society approach, the private sector, the public sector, and civil society. We need to take a leaf out of AIDS mobilization, which changed the world. We need to take a leaf out of breast cancer prevention in the United States and the pink ribbon campaign. We need to mobilize civil society and volunteers globally for cancer control. And we can get big wins by doing that. In conclusion, think about that young girl in Rwanda and with a huge facial tumor. Many believe that her human suffering, that all of this human suffering that I've talked about, all of this economic impact that I've talked about are simply a matters of personal choice, family responsibility, and free markets. But we can make health the easier choice. We can regulate industry. We can mobilize all of government. We can mobilize all of society. We don't have to just take the status quo. We can have cancer prevention in a just society. And if we do that, we don't even gain just the benefits of longer lives. What we do is we prevent pain, we prevent suffering, we prevent devastation of families and communities. And this is an aspiration within our reach. While we ought to and we must act locally, we also need to think globally. We need to press the United States government to do more globally for cancer prevention. We need to press the World Health Organization to spend more on cancer prevention and control. We need to press the United Nations not only to mobilize around Ebola and AIDS, which are critically important, but also the devastation and the huge unimaginable inequalities that exist in the world with cancer and other non-communicable diseases. This is something within our grasp, and I really urge you to take up this, this, this call um, for global health with justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gostin, for those terrific remarks. Very inspiring. In the interest of time, we'll go right on to Ambassador Cowell. Thank you, Maisha, and thank you all for being here so late into this afternoon. Professor Gostin, my friend Larry, has just presented a, a sobering and an accurate picture of the global cancer burden. In contrast to the pretty good news we hear in the United States, 22% drop in the last couple of years in cancer rates. All over the developing world, as he's told you, we're seeing cancer rates rise. So 65% of the cancer incidents in the world, 70% of the cancer deaths in the world, they're in low and middle income countries. But the good news is that ACS is in a unique position to make progress. We heard this morning in the panel that Rich Wender chaired uh, about colorectal cancer, that ACS is at its very best when it's faced with its biggest challenge. Well, let me tell you something. The global cancer crisis may be the biggest challenge we have ever faced. So in Jim Collins' terms, this is a, a big, hairy, audacious goal on steroids. But we know what to do. We have the tools, and we know how to do it. 
working in conjunction with our volunteers and our staff all across this great country and with our partners in the developing world. We know what to do. We know how to do it. So I take another leaf from a presentation this morning, the marketing presentation given us to us by Daniela and Jeff. And I propose that in dealing with this global cancer crisis, we adopt the Nike slogan, and we just do it. We are really at a defining moment in cancer. We won't really finish the fight until all of us are benefiting from the progress we are making. Yesterday, we saw a great portrait of Abraham Lincoln being drawn up here. And I couldn't help but think of Lincoln's plea and Lincoln's cry that we couldn't exist as a nation which was half slave and half free. And like Lincoln, I don't believe we can live in a world forever in which we are a tiny island of hope in a sea of despair. Just look at what's happening in the Middle East and even in Paris last week. When populations are denied basic human rights, including the right to access to information that could save their life, lives and to basic health care, those are societies which are inherently unstable and capable of wrecking great havoc on their own societies and on ours. So the fight for health care and the fight for justice in health is an important one for all of us. Our knowledge and our expertise and our power as a convener at ACS go far beyond our borders. No matter your role in the society, you're a part of a larger global role to make cancer history. In the last year that I've been privileged to be a part of ACS, I've traveled all over the globe on behalf of the society, and I've met some incredible people, the people that we're fighting for. There's Joe. He lives in Kibera. It's a slum in Nairobi, one of those mega cities that Daniela talked about this morning. Joe lost his 10-year-old son to Burkitt's lymphoma for want of $435 in chemotherapy drugs that would have saved his life. Today, 90% of children, and we heard such an, uh, an amazing story in the last panel, but 90% of children in our world with cancer survive. 90% of the children in the developing world with cancer will die. Or what about Myra? She's a breast cancer surgeon in Brazil. She could spend all of her time making a lot of money and operating on rich patients. But instead of doing that, she has devoted her time and energy with the help of ACS and ACS CAN to founding breast cancer advocacy organizations all over the country. And together, they have moved the needle on breast cancer so that every woman in Brazil has a right to a mammogram at age 40 and to repeated mammograms, not just the rich women, but the poor women. So I wish I had time this afternoon to tell you about all the great things that we are doing around the world to really address this cancer burden, from palliative care to providing chemotherapy to providing radiation to emphasizing prevention. And I don't have time to do that. I hope some of you will come to our breakout sessions tomorrow and we'll talk about it a little bit more. But what I would like to talk about is how we're working in a very few places to build on the ACS domestic mission to save lives by helping people to stay well, to get well, by finding cures, and by fighting back. And that includes establishing global relay chapters around the world. What we want to do is achieve the greatest impact for the greatest number of people. We won't be able to do that in every country, and we won't be able to do that with every cancer. But putting our money and our efforts where there are good abilities to use prevention to prevent cancer, where prevention can really make a difference in tobacco and nutrition and physical activity and in life-saving vaccines like HPV for liver cancer and HPV for cervical cancer, those are best buys. And so we're focused on the best buys and measurable results in countries where the policy environments are conducive to our working and where we have the kind of contacts where we can work to make a difference. 
Our focus for this year, our number one focus, is on something that Larry already mentioned, and that's cervical cancer. We have a 91% survival rate in the United States. Cervical cancer, when caught early, is successfully treated. And of course, through vaccination, uh, most of it can be prevented. And yet 270,000 women last year lost their lives from cervical cancer. 85% of them were in low and middle income countries. And they weren't just a cross section of the population in low and middle income countries. They were the poorer people in the poor countries. So this is a disease of poor women in poor countries. And they're not just women who are dying in their 60s and 70s, but women who are getting ill and dying in their 20s and 30s and 40s at the prime of their lives and when they are so important to their families and their communities. So how can we make vaccination and screening and treatment of precancerous lesions accessible and affordable? What, and what would that cost? In order to get that number, we went to the Harvard School of Public Health to find out. And the results are in. We hope that understanding of what it will take to address the cervical cancer burden will be the basis for a global movement, such as the movements to address HIV, AIDS, malaria, and polio that have been so successful in recent decades. It's not cheap. Depending on the prices for vaccines, which of course vary from a low price in Gavi countries of $4.55 per shot, and a different price in delivery, and different prices for the different kinds of screening treatments from our Cadillac treatment of, of um, pap smears to a, a literally only pennies treatment of looking at a cervix and swabbing it with vinegar. Uh, the Volkswagen treatment, we might say. The cost varies, but it's in the neighborhood of $3 billion to $7 billion per year over the next 10 years. Now, these are big numbers, but they're, with these resources, we could vaccinate every 10-year-old girl in, a low, in 100 low- and income, middle-income countries, and we could screen every woman between the age of 30 and 49. That's about 1 billion women per year. We could screen them at least twice in their lives. And think of the difference that would make. So let's just do it. Our first action is going to be to convene a donors conference, which we plan to do this year, and begin to really raise this degree of interest and this, the, the, this coalition of the willing including government, the private sector, and civil society together to end this cervical cancer even in my lifetime. Another way we're working to, to, uh, to make women's cancers a priority is through collaboration with partners all over the world. We have convened and we are the sponsor of three very important women's cancer coalitions. The first one is broader than just cancer and it's about women and NCDs, and we formed it at the time of the 2011 high-level meeting at the United Nations, and it's doing some very important work. The second is our Cervical Cancer Action Coalition, and that's the group we will use to spurhead this move um, this year onto the world stage for cervical cancer. And the third is something we'll announce the launch of next week um, at World Cancer Day, and that's a Global Breast Cancer Alliance. It will have its, as its target increased survival for 2.5 million women by the year 2025. I'm convinced, based on my own experience working on HIV and AIDS, that we can harness the same kind of channeled and focused grassroots advo advocacy and activism that led to an important focus on AIDS, and which has totally changed the profile of that disease from a galloping pandemic to a managed chronic disease. It's not for the faint of heart, but ACS is not faint of heart. So I hope you'll come to our breakout session tomorrow. And remember that February 4th is World Cancer Day. And I hope you'll join colleagues around the world virtually to do everything that we can do together to raise the profile of cancer around the world to make this century cancers last. Just yesterday, 
Tommy Caldwell and Kevin Jorgensen made it to the top of El Capitan, using only their hands and their feet. Some said it could never be done and shouldn't be tried. But Kevin and Tommy proved them wrong. So I know we can make this century cancers last, and together we will. Because where you live shouldn't depend if you, on if you live. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Cowell, for your remarks. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to have to forego questions. Um, and in closing, I'd just like to say thank you um, for the thought-provoking and critically important session we've had on, on global health. And um, we need to think about the collective roles that we play as actors, each of us trying to do our own part addressing the cancer crisis within our homes, our communities, our countries, and on the wider global stage we occupy. We know our challenges and we have a sense of the paths that will lead to sustainable solutions thanks to the expertise and guidance of leaders such as those we've heard today. I'd like to thank Professor Gostin and Ambassador Cowell for their remarks and commend them once again for the significant contributions they both made to public health both here in the U.S. and globally. Thank you.